Sai, uh, the last speaker is Sai Nudurupati. Um, and Sai is going to present uh, modeling, uh, transit, uh, eco response to climate variability since the late placial, uh, Pleistocene using MATLAB, or uh, LENTLAB, sorry for that. Sai? Thank you, ahead. Albert. Um, thank you very much. Um, it's an honor to be here and presenting at the stage. Uh, I'm Sai, and I did this work during my PhD at University of Washington, uh, Seattle. And I would like to thank my advisor, Professor Arkan Istanbulolu. Um, and I also want to thank the LANDLAB team um, I have used LandLab extensively and I'm also a developer of LandLab and I've learned so much from the team. And thank you CSTMS. I've been coming to CSTMS for, for a good time. Uh, I was actually gonna say, it feels like home if I was gonna be there, but I'm literally at home still. So. Um, and this uh, research is funded by NSF and thanks uh, to them for helping us with that. So, um, My area of research is uh, semi-arid grasslands of central New Mexico. Um, and I've been, um, I've been investigating the effects of changes in climate and disturbance trends. By disturbances, I mean wildfires and grazing. And the grasslands here are really sensitive to changes of these uh, order. And what happens to these grasslands is that they are converted into woody, uh, woody uh, plant land or woodlands. Uh, that can be either shrublands or forests. For example, if the grazing is uh, stopped, uh, suddenly the grasslands would uh, turn towards forest rather than a shrubland. And the current consensus is that the natural fires are, are good for the grass cover and not good for the woodlands like shrubs and trees. And that the suppressed fires actually are not good for grass, but more uh, better for shrubs that are invasive. And grazing is by default uh, removing grass uh, in these grasslands and wetter climate favors forests, drier climates favor shrublands. So to study these we created uh, different components in LandLab. Um, if you have heard of LandLab, LandLab has a set of process defining components and we, we created uh, hydrologic and ecohydrologic components and put together a model by coupling them. Uh, and we modeled PIP, the plant functional type wedge cover as a function of water stress and availability of seeds. So this is a two layered model that I'm showing you here. The interstorm vegetation dynamics model um, looks at each individual cell in the domain and looks at how the hydrology is affected and how the soil moisture decay happens over time. And this information is used to understand how much vegetation biomass is created depending on what vegetation type sits on there. And there's a second layer of the model that is run at every uh, at an yearly time step. And this looks at the cellular automata plant establishment and mortality, depending on some rules, such as say, if the, there is too much water stress at a cell, then it is very likely that the, the plant type is gonna be replaced by bare soil at that location. And for establishment, a bare soil cell is, is, uh, is occupied by a well-doing um, neighbor. Um, and, and there are a lot of rules that, uh, uh, that give certain advantages to certain plant types. For example, trees can propel their seeds longer than shrubs. So if on a plain uh, field, a trees would dominate if trees and shrubs were in the e ecosystem. So we brought this model and we ran it with the modern um, day climate at in the central New Mexico area. So the mean annual precipitation is around 250 millimeters, 10 inches of rain. And the top left, I'm showing you a typical flat surface here in uh, central New Mexico. Uh, there are sporadic trees, juniper pines, and some shrubs and, uh, and grass. In, in the top right figure, I'm showing you a simulation where we started it with um, an a, a equal random condition where equal plant co covers were, were there. So each cell is occupied by one plant type. An orange cell is, is a shrub. A green cell is, a green, uh, is grass. A black cell is a tree. And a white cell is bare soil. The shrubs here are invasive and trees um, 
cannot survive in these flat surfaces because there is not enough moisture. So the trees die off with time, but the shrubs dominate because they, they are drought resistant and they also have um, an advantage over grass. Uh, they could send chemicals underground to kill grass. Keeping the climate constant, we brought in the topography and suddenly we see that the trees could actually survive. Um, and this is, this is typical in this, in this ecosystems. On the top left, I'm showing you a, a watershed where the north facing slope is occupied by juniper pines and the south facing slopes is mostly dominated by shrubs. And we can actually observe that here in the model. Um, and the reason for this is that the, the cumulative decrease in the solar radiation in between the north facing and south facing slopes get, could uh, conserve enough moisture for trees to survive the heat. Now with this models uh, in hand, we wanted to ask these questions. Does the Holocene vegetation change? Um, can this be attributed to climate uh, variability since the late Pleistocene? Uh, what happened in the last 13,000 years? Could it be the reason why we are seeing uh, what we see right now? And do firegrass feedbacks and climate trends interact to reinforce shrub expansion or invasion? And we also wanted to look at the role of topography on ecosystem change. Um, we upgraded our model with um, another um, component which could explicitly process fires and grazing. Um, the fires would start, um, it would simulate lightnings and it would ignite the plant type in the cell depending on its susceptibility. And the fire would spread to the vegetated neighbors based on individual plants, plant vulnerabilities. And the grazing would um, remove random grass, um, grass cells. And it, can, it could be uh, upgraded again to like introduce grazing trends. The current understanding in the region is that over the last uh, 14,000 years, there were cold and wet trends and there were warm and dry periods. During uh, the last, during the times 14,000 years before present to 8,000 years before present, there were woodlands here. And then um, grasslands took over because of uh, initiation of a warm period. And then the shrubs made an uh, appearance around 8,000 years before present. And they have been dominating some of the water stressed areas in this region. We found a, a wonderful data set uh, from Hall and Penner 2013. What they did was they sampled um, uh, an exposed stratigraphy and found out um, the percentages of carbon so they could uh, distinguish between a cool grass and a warm grass. The C3 is the warm grass and C4 is the warm uh, cool grass. And they reconstructed mean annual temperature and mean annual precipitation at 37 different um, times in the past. We used this information and we, we corrected our daily um, meteorological data from um, a Sevieta LTER new, um, data, information, data. And we created, we reconstructed um, a paleo data set and it's summarized here. And we use that to, to calculate uh, mean annual PET, potential evapotranspiration for different plant types using uh, penman monte equations. And we, uh, we use this information to run our models. So we first started exploring the model uh, on the flat surface. And we tuned the model initially with the, with the climate that was at 13,000 years before present and ran it until it, uh, it, uh, it went to an equilibrium. And then we let the climate um, record that we created uh, drive the model. In the past, there was a cold wet period, like I told you, and the grasslands were doing well. And in gray, I'm showing you the fire frequency. Since the fires are explicit, you could see the blobs of white uh, appearing in the vegetation um, maps and when there was there was enough grass we could see a frequent natural fire system 
And a, a warmer dry period gave um, an advantage to the drought resistant shrubs and the shrubs finally took over and the grass cover went down. Trees could not survive anymore and, and they completely were wiped off from the um, flat surfaces. And there was a brief cold and wet period um, after that, which kind of helped grasslands recover a little, but it was not enough. Uh, and the modern day warm period, again, is helping the shrubs dominate in this region. And this is actually very uh, consistent with what, we, what was observed in the region. To look uh, into this in a little more detail, I'm showing you a vegetation maps at different years. Um, and we could, and I'm also showing you on the top left, the vegetation connectivity for grass neighbors. So what this is, is for, for every grass cell, I'm looking at how many grass cells are in its first neighbor, uh, first neighboring ring. And for the ears that have a lot of grass, we, could, uh, we can observe that there was a better connectivity compared to um, a shrub dominated landscape. So we brought in um, topography again, and we wanted to see how topography um, changes the scenario. And we suddenly see that the trees could survive um, in the warm and dry periods. And there, are, there is a consistent tree presence, especially in the north and south facing, the north facing slopes. And what happens here um, is if we look closely, there was, there was um, a warm period during the 9,000 year um, before present, but the trees survived from being wiped out. And there were, again, some droughts. And there was an extended warm period, but the, the north facing slopes gave a refuge to trees. The grass cover came down, but the shrubs invaded but a, um, a slight increase in precipitation, again, gave an advantage to grass and trees. So in a, on a level playing field, shrubs would, shrub, shrubs would dominate grasslands and, if, and trees would dominate shrubs. So I think the, shrubs, uh, the trees dominating shrubs also help grass to come back a little faster. To look at this, simulation in little detail, I'm showing you the evolution of the vegetation um, map of vegetation on the, on the, in the domain from 7,800 years before present. And the warm period kicks in, the shrubs take over the flat uh, lower surfaces. And then when the, when the mean annual precipitation goes up, the grass comes back in the, in the flat regions and then the trees survive the warm period. I'm, I'm um, stressing the fact uh, in the top figure, I'm, I'm grouping all the uh, snapshots where there were more shrubs and we could find that the connectivity is low. And in this bottom figure, I'm showing you the figures, uh, the maps where there were more grass and the connectivity is good. We want to stress the point that the a better connectivity is good for fire spreads, uh, natural fire trends, and that is also good for grasslands in this region. And this is what we infer from our modeling endeavors. So a grassland would, um, when a wet, and wet to dry um, climate change happens, then the trees and grass die, shrubs expand, that reduces the connectivity and also reduces the fire size which in, in turn increases the, uh, improves the uh, favorability of shrubs and then a woodland uh, or a shrubland is formed. But if there is a dry to wet transition, then the trees are favored, which, um, which dominate, uh, which kind of have an ex competitive advantage over shrubs. And this would also help grass and improve the connectivity and then increases the natural fire frequency and keeps the grassland healthy. Uh, to summarize, natural fires are good for healthy grasslands. Suppressed fires are good for woody plant encroachment. Grazing is, is again, uh, favoring woody plant encroachment. Wetter climate um, helps keeping savannas uh, healthy and the drier climates, um, again, 
help the shrublands grow. Thank you, and I'm open for questions. Thank you very much, Sai. That was great. Um, so we have a minute uh, for questions. Um, and again, you can raise your hand or you can place it in the chat. While we're waiting, um, let me ask you one question, Sai. So sure. you, you reconstructed climate and you know you found colder periods and drier periods versus wet and warm. Um, and you you correlated the vegetation with fires. And I'm wondering actually if those fires are probably triggered by lightning, right? Mm -hmm. And did lightning, the frequency of lightning, did that change over time? And were you able to, to capture that with a proxy or something like that? That's a great question. I did try to find a lightning, um, um, lightning data set, but we we used a constant lightning frequency. It can be altered in the model, and we did experiment with with few. But we we used a lightning frequency to correlate it with the current national fire trends. Yeah, okay, thank you. But it thank can you. be it can be altered in the model. It can be given as an input. Cool. And I see Mike Stackler has a question. It's moving up and uh, there are a few questions there. Um, so from Mike Steckler, uh, when the climate changes, what is the time scale for the landscape to adjust to a new equilibrium? And does it differ from different type types of changes? Um, that's a very good question. Um, so what we did is that we, we took the climate, there were 37, pines in the past that we got information from. And we took the midpoints of those uh, locations and we changed the climate and we let the climate change naturally occur in the sense we, we just abruptly changed the climate and then we let the vegetation um, orientation change by itself. Finding an equilibrium is, it, it, might, it might depend on the climate change itself and I don't think we, the coarseness of this model wouldn't allow us to exactly predict how much time it would take. But um, in this area, we have read that um, the shrub invasion has happened uh, or is observed a lot over the last 150 years. Um, and when we did these studies individually, we could, we could actually recreate a lot of that but we didn't actually study exactly how much time it took for each of the climate change trends to bring the ecosystem to an equilibrium. But we can actually see, um, so here the warm and dry period came, but when the shrubs were there, there were some threshold propelled, um, like there was a threshold that was um, exceeded and then the shrubs suddenly shot up and then there was an equilibrium for a certain time. And then the, again, the climate changed, but it took a little bit of time um, for the equilibrium to set in. So it may be because of the, um, the time it takes for the connectivity to improve, the grass to populate and then get connected, and then the natural fire trends to come back. So there are many factors that would play over there. 